the panel really quickly. Um, right here is Martha Hayden. She's the vice president of the Rosemary Beck Foundation. Uh, she's a painter and her work has been exhibited widely. She's participated in shows at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Milwaukee Museum of Art, the National Academy Museum in New York, um, the Western Museum in Racine, Wisconsin, the Butler Institute of American Art in Youngstown, Ohio, and the uh, El Paso Art Museum, among uh, many others. And she was a student of uh, Oscar Kukashka. Um At the end here is uh, Doug Talpaz. He's a painter and studied uh, at the New York Studio School from 1999 to 2002 um, with both Mercedes Matter and Rosemary Beck. Um, <clears throat> he worked at assist as an assistant to the painter Paul Resica from 2003 to 2010 and currently uh, works uh, in his studio in Brooklyn. His recent solo exhibitions include uh, The Tale of a Horse, uh, Israel in 2011, um, a solo show in New York in 2009, a recent group show of painting in New York in 2011. There and back again, a traveling show uh, that, that went from Holland to Grand Haven and Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2009 to 2010, um, and the Bauer Gallery annual juried show in 2009. Right here is Jennifer Samet, uh, a New York-based art historian, curator, and writer. She's a professor of art history at the City University of New York and co-directs the gallery Stephen Harvey Fine Art Projects um, on the Lower East Side. She completed her dissertation at uh, CUNY Graduate Center on painterly representation in New York, 1945 to 1975, which included Rosemary Beck as one of the figures she was researching. Um, as part of that research, Jennifer interviewed Rosemary Beck in 2002. She's curated major historical exhibitions on the Jane Street Group, uh, the history of the New York Studio School, and reconfiguring the New York School. She's particularly interested in the voice of the artist and has published many interviews with painters, including an ongoing series, Beer with a Painter, on Hyperallergic. Uh, so I encourage you all to check that out on Hyperallergic. Um, <coughs> and finally, we have Catherine Drabkin. Um, she received her BFA from the Maryland Institute uh, and her MFA from Queens College. She's exhibited work, work both nationally and internationally uh, and is included in numerous public and private collections. Her recent, uh, recent solo exhibition at the Madeline Cohen Gallery at the Community College of Philadelphia traveled to the Blair Gallery in the Hoyt Art Center in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Her most recent project, Finding Home in American Neighborhood, is an artist book inspired by her neighborhood in downtown Wilmington. It received uh, support from an opportunity grant from the Delaware Division of the Arts. She was she's been represented by Krishar Galleries since 1995 and was a founding faculty member of the Delaware College of Art and Design. Um, and I think uh, we'll get right into it. I want to hear about Rosemary's life and work. Um, and I think Martha will begin by talking a bit about um, Rosemary's biography and uh, some of the, the genesis of uh, where the show came into being. First I want to thank Eric for organizing this and finding us this space. And uh, we're very appreciative thank you. of all the work that you've done on getting this together. I'm just going to give a short bio. A lot of you know all this, so bear with me. Uh, Rosemary is a graduate of Oberlin College with majors in history of art and music. She was an accomplished violinist and played until she had an auto accident in 1974 and could no longer get her wrist into the proper position. She began to paint seriously in the late 40s while living in Woodstock, where she was friends with Philip Guston and Bradley Walker Tomlin. Tomlin arranged for her to study with Robert Motherwell, and she was included in important shows, the Coots Gallery's Young American Talent, 1951, the Stable Gallery, 1953 and 55, and at the Whitney Contemporary American Painting, 1955. She was in Martha Jackson's 1956 exhibition, New Talent in the USA, which traveled extensively. She showed at the Whitney every year until 1958 and was included in the Art Institute of Chicago's American Show twice. Her career as a second generation abstract expressionist was well established. There were reviews in Art News and in Time Magazine. Uh, but in 1952, uh, Rosemary Beck began to make portraits, which materialized mysteriously out of the grid of the abstract, non-objective paintings that she was making. 
By 1953, while continuing to paint in that way, she had made a number of expressionist self-portraits and was drawing from life. Her 1956 to 57 abstract house series was the epitome and also the end of her non-objective work. The abstract ore in my veins had run out, she wrote. By 1958, she was making still lifes, big paintings with very large objects, very close to the picture plane, almost not recognizable. And she began a number of figural compositions from life, mostly paintings of friends. This decision to work this way was a very courageous and expensive one because opportunities that had been there before began to disappear. These paintings, the ones in this exhibit, are from the 60s. They're probably not done from life, but they are done from drawings and small paintings done quickly for models. And Paul could speak to some of this because he was a part of this drawing endeavor from these two models. Uh, she at, used those drawings and then added elements that were real, like the parts of a room and lampshades and, and you know all kinds of things to make. She always liked to have a setting. They're not at all like what you would expect a figure painting from the 60s to look like. She drew constantly. The estate contains thousands of small sketches and scores of sketchbooks. She always approached painting abstractly. The first priority was always to make a spatial whole. And secondly, she wanted concreteness. Red was not to be just a painterly red, but also a flag, a scarf, blood, something real. In 1960, in a lecture, she stated, I am now convinced that if the anguish of paradox is not somewhere felt, the paradox of a patch of paint being also a hand or an apple, we are still hungry. There is just not enough food for the mind. She showed with Peridot through starting in 1960, Poindexter from 1975, and with Barbara Ingber from 1979. She became a member of the National Academy in 1982 and was a three-time Altman Prize winner. She's had three posthumous shows at Laurie Bookstein and will have an exhibit at Stephen Harvey Fine Arts in June. Yes. She taught at Middlebury College at Vassar and Queens College from the mid-60s and lastly at the New York Studio School. She's included in the collections of the Whitney, Renmar, Cochrane Gallery, the Hirshhorn, the Hood Museum, the McCoy Institute, the Newberger, SUNY Purchase, Trenton Museum, Vassar College, University of Nebraska, Smith College, and the National Academy of Design, among others. During the last months of her life, when she could no longer go downstairs or out, working from her own paintings, Rosemary Beck made a series of small washes. Surveying them, she said, at least they will have to say I composed and surely she did with color form and rhythm she composed the whole always the foremost thing and then I want to say a few things else one of her mantras was forming never form always forming never form by that she meant that the painting needed to be open-ended everything needed to move through everything else Rhythms and harmonies had to be found, a whole had to be created out of all this, not forced. It meant finding, not imposing. The structure was always abstract. Thank you very much. Um, and I think that that might segue into, I wanted to hear a little bit from Dove about, um, you studied with Rosemary um, from 99 to 2002. Um, and Rosemary was a really influential teacher to many, many painters. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit from you about your experience with Rosemary in the studio and uh, her, her ethos as, um, as a mentor. Yep. Um, when I, s I have one sentence I have to say because she told me to say it if, if they ever ask. <laughs> 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 she Perfect. said if they ever ask, 
uh, say I wasn't nice. <laughs> so, world me wasn't nice. Um, that's it. That's it. She was unbelievably caring. So, I guess there is some distinction there. Um, I, I signed up too for Mercedes class, um, not knowing of Mercedes, of Rosemary, and not knowing of Mercedes also, but they showed me Mercedes uh, catalog and I signed up for that. And uh, we walked into the class and, and Mercedes had all the, um, all the aura, you know, and the, she was impressive, she was charismatic, and you just kind of, um, and Rosemary was none of that. Um, but slowly, slowly she had just this powerful voice and um, it was amazing. And, and it's like um, Mercedes would tell you, you have to really feel what you're looking at and feel the sensations coming from that still life and be as honest as you can about this connection with the still life and the painting. And Rosemary would be like coming in just after and saying, well, why don't you do a collage or experiment or just go wild and, and kind of like saying almost the opposite, but, but it was really powerful because it was a release. It wasn't like uh, all this, Mercedes was so, um, uh, it was so like, you have to do, you have to feel, you have to do. And, and Rosemary was like, well, who knows? You know, just go for it. And, um, so that was, that was one thing. Um, and then, and then there were, God, there were so many stories. Um, one time I, I was painting, I was working on a figure, and I was feeling really good about it. I was making all the details in the figure, and I was feeling, wow, I can really do this. And, um, and then she came, and she was like, wow, this is amazing, incredible. And I was all like, ah, I'm feeling great. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then as she turned away and started walking outside the class, she'd be like, why don't you move that figure about an inch to the side? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, and you, you know, you put all the <laughs> effort you can into this, and it basically means, well, you know, I have to kind of start all over. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that, that was <laughs> a polite way of saying start over. Right. <laughs> basically, um, and, and that was like um, almost every time she came and, and talked about painting or or something. It was really lifting your spirit and, and feeling this uh, uh, passion that she had, and, and this, and also it, it making you see it, but also at, that sa at the same time giving you a really um, the other side of that. You know, um, I have a lot of stories, um, but one of them is um, I think in, 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 I'll just I'll jump to that. It's, it's Basically, after I finished school, um, I kept in touch, and um, and she was very sick, and, and we met. At the, we still met at the Met sometimes, and and every time we we, we met at the Met, and she ended in front of the Rose, of the Rembrandt self portrait. That was the biggest um, for her, and and um, but one time I came to visit her, and that, that's where I met Paul, um, and she asked Paul if I can be his assistant there, and he agreed. And um, so that was a great gift. Um, and, and also, I, 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 one of those times, I brought a painting. This was actually the last time I met her. Um, I, I brought a painting to show her, and it was a new, new kind of painting for me because I, I got out of school, and, and the, the school is so powerful. They are so powerful. They tell you to paint from life, to paint this thing. And, and it took a long time to start like trying to do something I, I was interested in more than just what they told you. And so I. I I was reading a book and I was trying to paint that story and funny enough it was interesting that in the end I was more interested in doing what she was doing which is painting from from stories and um, and uh, so I brote this painting and it had it had, um, it had the two trees a, a mountain and of two figures and I showed it to her and she was very very sick at that point she barely could open her eyes for more than 10 seconds um, but she looked at it, and, and the first thing she said was, um, well, the drawing never stops, never stops in, in the painting. And then she, she kind of fell asleep, and then she woke up again, and she said, um, and she said uh, one day you'll find a resting place in it, uh, a profound rest. And then, and then she fell asleep again. Then she woke up, and then she said, looked at it, 
why don't you add a donkey in there? <laughs> <laughs> that was the last thing I heard of. That's, uh, I think that sums it up. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you mentioned that the approaches in the, in the actual studios between Rosemary and Mercedes in that uh, Rosemary was encouraging to take bits from the still life to work out collages, to work out drawings. Um, and we get that, I mean, we see that in the work that she was making and that she was building together these multiple figure compositions from life drawing, from uh, sketches, from studio sketches. Um, yeah. So when you, I mean, just when you, when you po illustrated that, uh, it started you know, to, to crystallize that idea a little bit uh, for me in relation to these particular paintings. So Jennifer, yes. um, I think I want to hear a little bit about, uh, we had talked about Rosemary uh, as deeply interested in literature, mm -hmm. music, mm -hmm. um, she was very highly intellectual, read mm -hmm. all the time. Yes. Um, and the work that came right after this body of work, she began to use allegory, myth, mm -hmm. legend. Um, so I thought maybe you could speak to that a bit, um, Rosemary's literary life, intellectual life. Sure. Um, well, I did, um, as Eric mentioned, um, meet Rosemary in 2002, and she was just, um, she just impressed me as such a fierce um, thinker and intellectual, and um, that really came across in our conversation. So as Martha said, um, you know, she talked about her biography a little bit, and um, studying, you know, meeting Gustin, um, and uh, Bradley Walker Tomlin, and through him studying with Robert Motherwell. Her husband was um, a literary scholar, Robert Phelps. And so she had three shows of abstract painting at Peridot in the 50s, and then in the 60s, um, she began to make representational work. And so these are some of the early representational paintings that she mm -hmm. made in the 60s. So she sort of started out by um, painting, her first representational subject was the maquillage, so the putting on makeup of um, women in a room. And we were looking at some of those paintings in the studio the other day. Um, and then um, she went into the lovers, and then she had certain mythological um, series that she was particularly focused on. So um, those were uh, Orpheus, Antigone, Phaedra, and also Shakespeare's um, The Tempest. So those were her main subjects. And she was also very interested in astrology. Mm. And um, that was a big passion of hers. And she mentioned to me in the interview that she had intended to basically, in her painting, um, paint all 12 houses and all 12 signs, but she basically got stuck on the house of Venus. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's really what we're looking at mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. is basically the house of Venus. But for her, the house of Venus, so we're looking at the lovers and a lot of bodies in here, um, and we talked a little bit in our conversations um, about sexuality and um, what that means, the erotics of um, Rosemary's paintings. But I think, really, for her, it was when she talks about the House of Venus, she's talking about all of art making. So it's not just sex or lovers, it's the sensuality and her love of, of writing and of language. And so Shakespeare wasn't really just um, the story, the whole story of The Tempest, although that narrative really interested her, but it was also certain lines that she was captivated by, even sort of um, stage directions in Shakespeare, just the way they were. So in The Tempest, she loved that line of like, enter mariners wet, you know? And um, so, so there's just so, certain evocations. So the House of Venus is just that whole idea of the passion of art making, and so Orpheus as well. But all of those stories, in a way, if you go through all of those stories of Orpheus, Antigone, Phaedra, and the Tempest, in a way, I was thinking about them all, they're all stories that are about um, 
banishment, exile, and basically forbidden loves, you know, for um, the traitor brother, for the, um, you know, for the dead in the case of Orpheus. So there is all these forbidden loves and sort of ideas of banishment and exile. And in a way, perhaps you can relate um, what Martha was saying, that this was a brave move that she made to become a figurative painter um, in the 60s and um, to a kind of um, artistic exile, basically, that she committed herself to. Mm. Um, but, but it was, she knew it was hers, it was, um, and she believed, uh, she gave this talk, um, instead of basically giving the standard artist talk about her work, she gave a talk that was um, a series of fictional letters to mm. an imagined, um, like if an art student would write you a letter asking a question. Um, she would, um, this would be the response. So this was how she gave her artist talk. But in there you can find sort of nuggets about her ideas on art. And one thing that comes across is that she really believed in the personal voice, being true to that voice. So she knew uh, there was no escaping being in the House of Venus or being attracted to the narrative. That was her, that was her voice as this sort of thinker. And, um, and, and person. And at the same time as she was so attracted to the narrative, she also, as Martha was saying, um, was focused completely on, on form and formal issues. So when she gave a talk about the picture, on the subject of the picture plane, she said, you know, the picture plane is my number one concern. Um, and part of that is the time, too. So there's, a, there, there's an anecdote that she told me that she was actually on a panel discussion like this, um, and Leland Bell was on the, on the panel, and she looked at a painting you know, of a woman and a man um, in bed and said, am I right in thinking this painting is about the loss of innocence? And he was just furious and was completely silent. <laughs> so, <laughs> And she, she loved that story because, and, and I think the story tells a lot about her because she was, you know, as some of the stories um, Dove was saying, she was pr provocative and she was, and she was funny too. And um, so she wanted to, so it says something about her, but also the kind of energy that she wanted to bring into that situation. So she probably knew that Bella would, um, would react, react that way, yeah. but she wanted to bring that kind of energy into the room. And I don't know if Martha's going to tell the other story that she told me the other day, but I mean, she, <laughs> she brought um, kind of sexualized energy into, like, a, a, you know, according to um, this story at least, into sort of like figure drawing situation, which is pretty much like, you know, an, a fairly like asexual situation, even though you're drawn from the new, but she kind of brought energy into it because to to basically provoke so she likes this this tension is my point is she likes the tension between you know that it is that she's dealing with the flat surface and that it's the picture plane and all of that and all of the modernist concerns but also the narrative can I ask a question sure. do you think that that maybe is part of <laughs> do, you, do you think that that her decision to move into uh, bringing the figure or bringing objects into the painting in, from the 19, early 50s, mm -hmm. do you think that that was partly motivated by that kind of radical or, um, so it seems kind of subversive that I'm gonna now begin to paint uh, representationally. Do you think that that was um, kind of a challenge at? But it happened it gradually. It happened very gradually. Right. It wasn't an overnight no, decision. No, it wasn't like, I'm doing this, now I'll do that. Right, of course. That happened very gradually. Well, I think, I, I think also it was really about that she, she discovered how she had to be true to herself mm -hmm. and that she wasn't going to be fashionable. I mean, whatever she did, I think she tried to do completely from the core and from, from her deepest motivations. Yeah, I, th I agree. Um, I don't, I, I, would, I wouldn't think that she was deliberately trying to be subversive. That doesn't sound too much like what I would imagine that her intentions were. I, I agree that 
I think she knew that it was true to herself, um, also that it was gradual. But what I do think that she liked was that tension. So I think she likes the tension, the play. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is in all great painting, is inherent to great painting, is the sort of tension between, between life, between the objects, and between the fact that it's a painted world. Right. And, um, so, and that's what she talked about, that kind of paradox of like, that it's a patch of paint and that you can also find your way around the space and around the object. And um, the other thing that, she, that comes across in her um, writing and in her thinking is this idea of the opening versus closed. So she was very interested in um, uh, like who you could categorize as like an open artist and a closed artist. And not, this is not like qualitative, like one is better or worse but that there's a difference between the open and closed artist. And so she said Leland Bell was um, a closed artist, whereas Louis Finkelstein was an open artist. But she was interested in this idea of basically opening up. And you can see in the paintings that that's what she does, is basically open up whole worlds. She complicates them. The, you know, you can see it in these paintings and in the painting that we were looking at where it took us a while to sort of decode what's the painted world, what's the model, what's the self-portrait of the artist. It was basically, she made things um, complicated. And, um, and in a way, because she, she does this, she opens up that space that I'm talking about. She leaves it open, that space between the real world where you can find your way around a form and the space of the paint. I mean, that's in all great painting, and I like to think of that, um, that sort of tension as being like this space between, um, between longing, between desiring, and having. Mm -hmm. And that's, okay. I think, what's in all great painting is that space between those two things. But I think that in Rosemary's paintings, she leaves it particularly open. So she doesn't, you know, close, she doesn't, you know, find her way easily around the form. These kind of like patches of paint and um, weaving of paint that she does, it leaves it even more opening, even more open. So whereas in some artists, there is that kind of like, you feel that desire to possess. In Rosemary, I feel like you feel that space. She's allowing a lot of room for you to come in and mm -hmm. move through it. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about um, the way, the different, the openness and the um, the paradox of the the image, I was thinking about the, that maquillage painting that we were looking at in the studio, mm -hmm. and that it's incredibly complex, and that you, in a, at some point, you become. I mean, the the painting overall, because of the way that she composes it, it holds you, but. It, you become destabilized as to what is an actual figure in the room, what is a work on an easel, what's a mirror, and it, it, that as soon as you were mentioning that, it made me think exactly. that's mm -hmm. that's a, it's an illustration of how how she was look, she was after complexity exactly, and so it leaves us if, if you think of those subjects that she was interested in as being like subjects of banishment or exile, it leaves us in a way in a space of like half exile between the painted world mm -hmm. and, the, and the real world, yeah. She mentioned, um, in something that I read, a positive, the quote was a positive ache for something, um, a positive ache for something solid or, or forming. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do get that, that there's this longing that mm -hmm. kind of comes out um, and that everything is not hammered down or resolved. Um, when you well, it's all resolved, but it's not hammered down. Right. Yeah. There's a difference between <laughs> it's resolve left open. and closed. Yeah. yeah. Left open. And, and it's finished. not mm -hmm. um, drawn. You know, there's exactly. no there's no um, drawing of a hand of a foot to the leg. They just sort of miraculously appear mm -hmm. out of all the the obs observed spots that finally coalesce, and you've got a foot, kind of magic foot. Absolutely. And. Uh, but you, you, can, you can't set out to make that. It just has to, 
it, it, it has to happen. It emerges. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that I mean, it strikes me every time I look at these is that every every piece of paint that makes up these paintings is just put there and left. And uh, there's so much decisiveness, but that in the decisiveness and this constant build up and finding, mm -hmm. you get to a place of openness. Yeah, she said she was a putter. A putter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> put, <laughs> some people put paint. I put paint and I, you know, uh, people have different ways of putting on paint, but Rosemary put each stroke and then that left it, and then there would be another stroke and another stroke, so you get this accretion, you get this buildup of strokes, until finally they become your bigger, larger shape, but they're all these puts. Modules, almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, uh, I'd like to say something about that. Um, and it's actually, uh, it's, it's actually a criticism I have of, of her work, and I had with her, and this is after I've studied with her, um, I, I came, I remember very distinctly, it was the one time that I, we kind of, this fought for a second. And it was, uh, I, I was like, Rosemary, I, I don't think you have to make a, make a, uh, make a painting, make a stroke here and then make something else here. Because that was, and, and she, she didn't like me saying that at all. Mm -hmm. She was, uh, it was not like an easy conversation. Um, and I was, because I feel for pain for painters, you know, there's no rules, and and, and obviously, I, I think she knew that, and, and it's not, and, and and I actually I respond the most to her last last very last painting because of this because I feel there's a letting go of certain things that just kind of happen from her way of working, but but I feel that uh, there is a real like ambition to find to to make a head complete and an arm complete and 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 not open mm -hmm. um and and it's uh and it's it, that there's no rules that you have to i know what she meant she meant that the whole has to be cared for and, and it's true I mean, she does care to a huge extent but but it's almost um also kind of a will that now i have to deal with with the, when i look at her work I have to deal with her will here, and I have to deal with, with, and, and, and so, yeah, so there, I have, a, um, so it's something, what I love is the intention, and I love her meaning, and that is beyond everything else, it comes through, but I, I do feel um, the need to say this, because I, I, I think it's important. And if, when you were just saying that, what I got from you just now is that yeah. you felt that when she did this, she really didn't have to do that. Is that that there didn't need to be? I'm getting that you, there didn't need to be echoes or uh, development of the, the form. And when I when I hear that, I think that's where the music comes in or the yeah. musical quality. And I've been thinking myself about music quite a bit lately, and how the texture of a piece, whether it's piano, or whether it's an ensemble, or whether it's an orchestra, there are all of these echoes, and they're building to something that, you know, we have the needs of reality, then we have the needs of the painting. And I think that whether or not what you say is true, I imagine that that was in there some, that, that musical, Need that need for rhythm and uh, the pleasure of of that kind of text textural complexity was I imagine what was driving that and I've never thought about that before so that's just fantastic for oh, me. Yeah, I think that her love of music very much uh, relates to the way the paintings are composed and she would talk about you know some of these strokes are eighth notes and some of them are whole notes and and uh, the rhythm of it was very attached to the music. She always listened to music while she painted it too, so it was just a very important part of, of uh, what she was doing. I, I wanted to say something, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. No. About the closed and open idea, mm -hmm. which I think gets, I mean, I've been watching these paintings for a little while now, and I, I think that gets at what makes me kind of crazy when I look at them, crazy about them, and just, 
un completely unnerved to me. Uh, I, you know, and I would say that people who are more closed in terms of form making, and they would probably say that they need the clarity, or we need the clarity, or the world needs the clarity. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. But I, I, I think what has, what made me cr just so, I don't know, taken with her work, mm -hmm. taken by her work, is, is that I think that Cezanne had a similar willingness to be, well, to let down his need to be clear, or to let go of his need to be clear, that, that he just was completely um, available to the complexity or mystery of reality and space and longing. But what makes me just so shocked by Rosemary's work, and I have been this way for a long time, is that Cezanne was looking more. I mean, Cezanne cooked up stuff, mm. but not the, not the way Rosemary cooked up things. And I, it just shocks me that she could make up these worlds that are so, so much in flux and so not tied down and so open to the mystery of discovery, like Cezanne's. But Cezanne, but Cezanne ha was coming back, letting nature help him a lot, lot more than Rosemary did. And somehow she was able to make that next leap. It, I, I just, it just amazes me. I, 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 I like what you're saying, but I disagree. I, that's <laughs> what's great um, about this. I, <laughs> I don't think, that, I think Cezanne completely wanted to be clear. Um, I think he totally wanted to be, I think clear doesn't mean that, you, that there's no mystery and that it's not. Um, clear means that, that for me, in a painting, clear means that to some degree things are, are, are sitting in the right space, they have form, they have all those things, but also there's the artist have worked really hard to, to, uh, and to allow whoever looks at the painting to not have work so much. And so I think Cezanne took it to a place that was, com um, that was uh, incredibly clear. It was never, I've never seen a, I mean, Cezanne that's not clear. Um, and, and, and I think I think Rosemary's intention was to get there, um, and, and I, I, I do believe that. I, I just, um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that. Uh, yeah, I just, um, I felt that there was something that that was a certain of kind of a fight within herself that 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 um, a lot of times. Uh, stopped her from going somewhere uh, that's really clear without losing all those things you talk about. So I, I don't know. That's for me. I, I I think I really think that in her self-portraits, for example, in in and in the late paintings, um, she got she gets to a place where where it's doing that and and and, and uh, yeah I. I my my favorite parts are the, the drawing parts and, and the figure, the way she can see the, the anatomy and, and have that work, you know, and and and, and that's my uh, that's and I think she was an incredible draftsman and she was in class. She, you can see there's so much to. Um, I mean, she studied uh, Michelangelo and 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 you know, and that's where. I feel a huge amount of expression in, in the way she 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 paints the the, the, the body and, and and finds a shape a new shape in there, but but yeah that's it. I mean I think she I think they they don't go where Sedan went, which is completely clarity for me. So, but I think in some of the large, I mean, in some of Cezanne's monumental figure groups like the Bathers, we lose there is. I mean, I understand what Catherine's saying, and that there's some ambiguity, and that there's 
and Cezanne, a high level, I mean, he gets quite abstract at certain moments, and the form begins to kind of decrystallize and then come back together. So, I mean, when I look at these works, um, I think of those, those the monumental Cezannes, and that some of them, some of the figures appear very strange, and uh, but convincing. Um, and that, you know, Rosemary, I think in these works, the figures, um, they, f they retain, they retain something that, I mean, Cezanne, I think, kind of blew it apart even more. I mean, I see, I, I see it in some of the, um, the, the studies in Rosemary's work. They become very, um, the figure starts to become um, very abstracted and, uh, and I guess that's sort of what I'm thinking of, Martha, about um, the notion of abstraction in this